Hello again, everyone. Thanks for watching Washington Gun Law TV. I am Washington Gun Law President William Kirk. Thanks for joining us. Hey, for those of you who've been geeking out on this channel for a while now, you know that the ATF has been on a complete rampage with all sorts of different new rules and regulations, all sorts of new enforcement efforts, all designed to inconvenience, yes, you, the lawful and responsible gun owner. But sometimes, once in a blue moon, you get to take the ATF's own words and use it against them. So today we're going to spend a few minutes talking about how the ATF just pissed all over assault rifle bans. Okay, so the issue we're going to be talking about today is not new. It's been kicking around here in the youtube -iverse for several weeks, and we actually did a video on this a few weeks ago, but unfortunately the nugget that I wanted to discuss got kind of lost in the shuffle with a bunch of other information that I threw into a large video when the rules about frames and regulations were first published. So this was there and you can check out that video at the link below. But let me, what I want to get you all to understand in this argument that's going on right now, and I think it's a very plausible, I think it's a very good argument, is that, hey, you know, the ATF just kind of admitted that any type of assault rifle ban is likely unconstitutional. Now, as a disclaimer, before we get too far down the road, I know some of you right now are flipping out, getting down into the comment section, telling me to quit calling them assault rifles. I get where you're coming from. I'm not disputing that point for a second. When I use the term assault rifle, semi-automatic assault rifle, semi-automatic rifle, whatever term I use, it's usually because that is the term that that legislature or legislative body has chosen to use in the legislation. Since I am reporting to you on what the current state of the law is or may become, I try to use the same words that's in the legislation. I in no way am promoting or endorsing the use of these terminologies depending on what we are talking about. Okay, now to understand this argument, and I'm going to put a link for everything you need to understand or down below, is you really just need two documents. What you need is the opinion of District of Columbia v. Heller, authored by Justice Scalia in 2008, and then you need all 364 pages of the ATF's new rules on frames and receivers, okay? And actually, you don't need all 364 pages because uh, you can look at all this. Again, I'm going to put the links down for everything below, or you can just take my word for it. Now, let's start with Heller. Why is Heller important? Well, first of all, th the facts of Heller were this. In the District of Columbia, in order to even have a handgun, you had to get a permit. And I mean, just to even have one, okay, in your own home, you had to get a permit. And shockingly, every time somebody went to the District of Columbia to get a permit, they were denied. So essentially, it was a de facto denial ban on handguns in the District of Columbia. So really, all that affected, of course, were all the lawful and responsible citizens of District of Columbia, because as we know, criminals don't typically buy their guns from Cabela's and Bass Pro Shop. Now, Heller challenged this law, and when it got to the United States Supreme Court, it was struck down for various reasons, but namely that it was in violation of the Second Amendment. Now, the big thing was a couple of rules of law that were very clearly announced. I want to talk about three very clear rules of law that were announced by Justice Scalia in the Heller opinion. Now, for those of you who want to read the Heller opinion, it's a fantastic piece of legal writing. And Justice Stevens wrote a dissenting opinion. And so both Scalia and Stevens spend a majority of their opinions uh, kicking each other in the shins and telling us why each one of them might actually be an idiot. But um, it is really, really good. Now, the first point is, is that Justice Scalia made is that the Second Amendment, when we take a look at all the historical consequences, because what the dissent was arguing is, hey, listen, a well-regulated militia is a prerequisite, and therefore the only individual who has the right to possess a firearm is actually those in the militia. That's actually what the minority are, uh, wrote in their opinion. So, you know, beware of where some people on the political left come from from a right that is not given to you actually by the Second Amendment. It's a God-given right. The Second Amendment says that government cannot take that right from you. It does not derive itself from the Second Amendment, but I digress. Okay, so the first thing that Justice Scalia said is, is hey, listen, 
when we talk about the types of firearms that are meant to be protected by the Second Amendment, because Justice Scalia acknowledged that not every firearm is protected by the Second Amendment. There are some firearms that there he essentially agreed with what some may term as reasonable gun legislation. I'm not going to get into that debate with you right now, but Justice Scalia agreed that there could be reasonable limitations, as there can on other constitutional amendments, such as the First Amendment. But what the justice said was, is that the, the types of firearms that we commonly use for self-defense are always protected by the Second Amendment. So that's the first important issue. The second important issue is, is when he took a look at the historical context and the fact that many states ratified their constitutions much later than the federal constitution was ratified, and therefore there was a change in firearm technology along the time. When we took a look at the historical perspective, the Second Amendment, in the eyes of Justice Scalia and the majority in Heller, said, and this is really important, that the Second Amendment clearly protects the types of firearms that are in current use at the time. That is, firearms that are very common to everyday use today would be the type of firearms that are protected by the Second Amendment. In fact, Justice Scalia specifically stated, we also recognize another important limitation on the right to keep and carry arms. Miller said, as we have explained, that the sorts of weapons protected were those in common use at the time. We think that limitation is fairly supported by the historical tradition of prohibiting the carrying of dangerous and unusual weapons. So again, what the justice is saying is, is hey, listen, dangerous and unusual weapons, true weapons of war, automatic weapons, short barrel shotguns, short barrel rifles, other destructive devices, he could understand the need to regulate that. But if we're going to start banning an outright ban on firearms which are commonly used, especially for self-defense, that clearly is going to violate the Second Amendment. Now, the third rule of law that Justice Heller announced was this, is that when we are taking a look at firearms regulation, if we're talking about the restriction on the use of a type of firearm, uh, basically an all-out platform ban on a particular firearm, we always used a strict scrutiny analysis. And candidly, if courts actually employed a strict scrutiny analysis, most of these gun legislation, AR bans, magazine bans, and many of the other crazy bans that we see in the bluer states in the country would not survive constitutional muster. So those are the three important rules of law. The Second Amendment protects the types of firearms commonly used for self-defense. The Second Amendment clearly protects the types of firearms that are in common use at this time for that purpose. And whenever we are assessing the constitutionality of gun legislation, we always apply a strict scrutiny analysis. And if it immediately invades upon the use of a type of firearm commonly used for lawful purposes, on its face, it's unconstitutional. That's the rule of law. Okay, so when we take that and then we take a look at what did the ATF say in their 364 pages of why they needed to change the definition of frames and receivers, okay? When the a government agency is about to rewrite all new CFRs, they have to write a summary report. A summary report is hundreds and hundreds of pages that talk about all the public policy reasons for why the legislation needs to be changed in response to many, many comments. Um, Mary Garland, the Attorney General on behalf of the Department of Justice, authored this report. But on page one, and I joked when I said you have to go three, it's 364 pages, it is. But on page one, and actually if you took a look at the hard copy in the actual CFR and the hard copy, I believe it's on page five. But this is how the ATF defines or what they have to say about the AR-15 platform. In the past few years, some courts have treated the regulatory definition of firearm frame or receiver as inflexible when applied to the lower portion of the AR-15 type rifle, one of the most popular firearms in the United States. So, here is the ATF and the Department of Justice acknowledging that the AR-15 is one of the most popular firearms, not one of the most popular rifles, one of the most popular firearms in the United States. And this is under the guise of Heller, which says, hey, listen, the Second Amendment protects the types of firearms that are in common use at the current time, primarily those that are used for self-defense, which the Department of Justice just admitted that is exactly what the AR-15 is. So if we could get 
an AR ban case before the United States Supreme Court. And I'm talking to you, New York, Maryland, California, New Jersey, Michigan, there's Hawaii, and all the other states that have these flat out AR bans. Washington State has tried it now twice with Senate Bill 5217. It has not gotten close to passing yet, but don't kid ourselves, they will try it again. But if any of those bans could get before, in particular, this Supreme Court, and the strict scrutiny analysis is applied, which Justice Scalia has made it very, very clear is the only analysis that should be used, none of these bans can survive. Listen, you may have more questions about what the ATF is doing or any of these other bans or anything related to your Second Amendment rights. And if you do, don't ever hesitate to contact us at WashingtonGunLaw.com or, of course, you can call us directly at 425-765-0487. Now, let's remember, part of being the lawful and responsible gun owner, like we talk about all the time here at Washington Gun Law, is to know what the law is in every situation and how it applies to you in any instance that you may find yourself. Until next time, thanks for watching. Stay safe.